This is the Daily Dispatch podcast with your business correspondent, Ted Keenan. Today, Dispatch Live is talking to... Winston Neurodon. And Winston, you're in the business of electric motor cars and electric charging. And you are an East London man. Yeah, lived in, lived in Cambridge in Byron Street and went to Cambridge High School. And all, all Cambridge schools, junior, junior, primary and high. Winston, with your experience in the business, are South Africans making too much of a fuss about electric vehicles or are we in fact not making enough of a fuss? In terms of the vehicles, I absolutely don't think we're make, making enough of a fuss. I think the, there's a lot of resilience for, for various good reasons, and I'm sure we'll unpack a few of those as we, as we talk this morning. Uh, and that is the, that the, the tech really is better. It's the new version of what cars are. And it's definitely what cars are going to be for the next 50 to 100 years. So this is the start of the new revolution. And I think because we, we've, there's always the people that say, no, no, but you can't change, or what if, or, and you always have the, the reason why you can't change. And I think those challenges are going to hold us back. And when they hold us back, it, we're going to fall behind in every way. We're going to fall behind in the value, the value chain of this market. We're going to fall behind in the rate at which we change. We're going to lose the benefit or we'll only get the benefit later. We won't get the benefit of the electric vehicles offer us earlier. We won't get them now. We'll get them in five years' time when we change because we have to. That said, the, it raises an interesting point, and that is that by 2030, whether we like it or not, we will have to have changed. And if we don't, our vehicle exports, which apparently are up to 60% of our total manufacturing capacity, are yeah. going to get blocked from going into certainly Europe and yeah. most of the first world countries. So, you know, as much as I completely agree with that statement, and you know, the rest of the world, I think the facts are, are quite simple. The rest of the world will pivot. They will make this change. Europe is making the change way quicker than anybody thought they would. So it's a reasonable to assume that all new vehicles, or the majority of new vehicles, 95% plus, will be electric by 2030, 2032, maybe, that sort of timing. Of course, that means that if we're not manufacturing electric vehicles, there's no market for us in Europe. Now, right now, most of our vehicles go to Europe, and that's where the risk sits. We, you know, I've, I, when I've spoken to people that are, let's just say, not positive about what the future is, so it's another time, and we just stop selling to Europe, we'll sell to the countries that want uh, fossil fuel vehicles. And, you know, yes, maybe, but maybe not. And... The, the bottom line is that electric vehicles are simpler. They are simpler and they will be cheaper. They might not be cheaper now, but once we get to volume, they will be cheaper. So within five years or less, three years potentially, we're going to see electric vehicles in the market that are going to be as if, um, cost effective as its equivalent petrol vehicle. So now you've got no decision around, oh, that's more expensive. It's going to absolutely be the same price as petrol or cheaper than petrol. And the only dis- discussion you have now comes around the operational side. How much it costs me to operate it? What's it going to cost me per kilometer? All of those. Those become the, the only questions that you, you would need to ask at that point. Not all. Oh, it's more expensive. There's some staggering figures going around. The, the one that I, I, I was quite amazed by is that China already has 500,000 electric buses on their roads. Oh, yeah. Now, I know China's got far more people than we have, so one would understand that. Yeah, but yeah, sure. did that number surprise you when you saw it? Definitely not, because I was over in China about two years ago meeting with one of the big bus suppliers. We were talking to them about buying charges because they also made charges. And while I was in the room, one of the guys, you know, sort of looked at the other one and, and sort of gave him a thumbs up and, you know, you could see it was a little bit of an achievement, but not, you know, nobody was throwing the party. But they were sort of indicating something did happen. So I said to him, I said, what is that about? So he said, we just got, a, we just got an order from Shenzhen City for electric buses. So I said, oh, amazing. How many? 4,000. <laughs> so I remember we probably only sell 1,000 buses a year here in South Africa yeah. in terms of actual buses. So to get one order in one shot, and, and I sort of pretty much in the start of business, and I think I've got an order for 4,000. And then I said to him, what are you guys making? He said, no, you know, that's why we're making 20,000, 30,000 a year. You know, so, so I'm not surprised if, I, if they've got five, um, 500,000 electric buses. 
Um, in fact, I probably wouldn't have been surprised if you told me it was a million because they really are adopting this. They are seeing the value. They're seeing that these less emissions, lower running cost, easier to maintain. They're seeing all those advantages already. And the quicker you pivot at that point, the better your chances are that you're going to save money out of this and make money out of it in the long term. Perhaps we will never make electric buses, and certainly not anywhere near the extent that China does, but we are starting to make electric vehicles. Um, can, can we catch up? You know, like apparently in Norway, eight out of 10 vehicles sold are electric vehicles. So pretty soon they're going to wipe out all of their need for fossil fuel. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I see no reason why we shouldn't be able to, to be able to catch up. Remember, most of the people manufacturing vehicles in South Africa, either, let's say, entrepreneurs building something from scratch, or there are big OEMs from overseas. So it will just be a case of bringing that technology here. You know, the thing that worries me as, a, as an entrepreneur is that we're going to just bring the tech in. We're going to buy in the license to build batteries. We're going to buy in the patents to manufacture cells. Whereas if we'd have reacted five years ago, we could have, we could have used people like the CSIR to design battery chemistries for us, to design anodes, cathodes um, that are going to be part of that, and we could be using South African patents in the manufacturing of these batteries. But because we're reacting later, we're going to just bring those tech, that tech in and just build it. So there's going to be less value for us as a nation. And we're going to see that same scenario playing out in all sorts of places. We're going to see it playing out in the peak management, in the software around that, in charging systems, in business ownership models. All of these things are going to go to exactly that same thing. You're going to either look and say, we're going to innovate and build a South African or an African way of handling this thing or evolving this business. Or when it, when it becomes, oh my gosh, you have to change now. Now you don't have time to go and evolve that technology. But all you have time to do is bring in the tech from overseas and do what they do. And, and I think that, again, would hurt us to some extent. The, the future of um, petrol stations as we know them, fuel stations, there's, there's a lot of doom and gloom in the press for the fuel station <laughs> owners saying, you guys are going to be out of business quite soon. But the reality yeah. is probably n not close to that. You know, even, even people like us who are exceptionally optimistic about how the industry will pivot, um, we don't think that fuel stations are just going to disappear. You know, when we talk about, let's say, optimistically, let's say 2030, we're able to reach 100% of new, electric, new vehicles being electric. It's not the fleet. <laughs> it's only new cars. It's not the fleet of vehicles, not the overall fleet. That overall fleet will still be predominantly petrol for at least another 20 years, you know, as more and more electric vehicles come into that fleet. But it's just there'll be no new vehicles coming in that are not electric. That, that's sort of the view that we, that we take. So based on that, the fuel companies absolutely have a role to play. But more importantly, and, you know, I grew up in Cambridge, and, and one of the pictures, the clearest pictures in my head was there was a mobile garage just at the top of Byron Street. And um, I can remember what that looked like. You know, two little pumps on the sidewalk, a little place where cars could go in and get serviced, okay? Yes. That was what a mobile garage looked like in those days. You walk into any filling station today, let's say a big uh, Shell Ultra City, um, you know, it's a small city. It's got uh, takeaways. It's got everything. It doesn't even do car repairs. So they have pivoted massively over the last 20 or 30 years. So when the filling stations look at this market, their view is, oh, we're not gonna, we can't change. We're not, what's going to happen? Well, guys, you've changed so much in the past. Just look backwards 20 years, how, how different you were. And the bottom line is, in 20 years' time, you should be as different, as differently evolved. So they'll be very different places. They'll, they will become, and I don't want to predict what that is. We've got our view of what we think it is, but they will be different. And they will still be in business, and they will still operate, and there will still be a, a places of business hubs. And we will all still recognize those, oh, that's a filling station. We might just feel that, you know, now it's actually quite cool to go there, to go and have dinner at a, at a fuel station. One of the things that uh, people that uh, have bought electric cars at the moment um, said to me, and I was quite staggered by this, that they can f charge their car by simply plugging it in at home. So it's, it's not massive technology. No, look, the, basically every car comes with a built in charging system inside of the vehicle. Or well, let's call it a charger. Um, and 
What a charger does is take AC electricity, turn it into DC, and use the DC to charge the battery. So all vehicles have got a small charger inside of the vehicle. So all you get is AC, 220 volts, and it can turn it into DC and charge the battery. If you're looking to charge the vehicle fast, then you bypass the charger inside of the vehicle, and you put the charger on the outside of the vehicle, <laughs> on the side of the pavement, yeah. and you put the real power over there, and you go direct to the battery and you charge it. So that's why we can charge batteries so much quicker in public charging stations, because they're a lot more expensive, a lot more complex, but they're bypassing the charging technology inside of the vehicle, which you would use as your home charger. And they're 100% right. I love the fact that every morning I wake up, my car is full. And, you know, from a cost perspective, right now, maybe 800 rand a month is what my, my electricity bill is, or well, on top of extra. So I'm paying about 800 rand a month extra, whereas I was, two years ago, I was on a 7,000 rand a month in the uh, petrol bill, because I drive about 150 days a day. So it just gives you an idea of how different that is. Of course, of with the petrol prices today, I think I'd probably be paying 12 grand a month for my petrol. Just to, to take a step back there, you said that um, a charge at a place like one of your 160 outlets is very quick. What do you mean by very quick? It's all relative. <laughs> um, so it's very quick um, in terms of if you're charging at home, it would take 6 to 12 hours to fully charge the car. Yeah. Whereas charging it at a, at a DC fast charging station, like in the one that's at Vincent Park, that's a 60 kilowatt charger. If you took a small RC there, you'd be full in about 25 minutes. If you went there with a, um, let's take one of the modern um, cars, so one of the Mercedes Benz cars, that have got about a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack, you would need an hour and a half to two hours to fully charge it. But that's quick because otherwise, you know, you send this home for a much, much longer period on the slower charging connections. So while you are, are bullish about the fuel stations not closing down in the foreseeable future, um, are the electric charging stations going to be situated somewhere else? I mean, they, they don't have to be situated at a fuel outlet. Yeah, so I suppose, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, we're going to see fuel stations a lot more at um, places like shopping malls. But again, I'm going to go back to that example I gave about the mobile, the mobile station. The mobile station, they sold tires, they sold tubes, they, they repaired cars there, they did services on cars. You don't do that today in a filling station. So the filling station evolved. Um, and I think they'll evolve again where you're going to find that they're not the only place that people fill up their cars with electricity. They might, though, in which you, you would also want them at shopping malls, you'd want them at office parks. Um, any place that's got people loitering or sort of hovering around for about an hour or two, they should have a charger because that's the perfect place. I'm here anyway, I'm as a plug in and get my charge for the day. The last question is around Eskom. Um, mm. we, we have load shedding. Does it impact on, on your industry as much as people would think? So I'm going to say that it doesn't it's impact it nearly as much as what people who do not have electric cars think that it will. So I think that's the first point. Mm -hmm. Is Yes, it does impact the industry, but certainly not at that level. It's not a case of my car won't be charged. And I gave you a time now where I said, you know, we need 6 to 12 hours to charge at home. That's assuming that it's a full charge, that the battery is empty. But, you know, if I look at my car, my car's got a 250-kilometer range. So if I fill it up at work and I drive back home, I've driven 75 k's. That's only a quarter, of, a quarter of a tank that I've taken out of the car, which means it's, I've only got to put a quarter of a tank back in overnight, which is like an hour and a half, two hours. So within two hours, my car is full again. Now, there's no load shedding schedule that I've seen so far that, um, and I do stress so far, that has not given me at least two hours during the night that my car can charge if it's plugged in. It's the same as your cell phone. You know, you plug it in when you get home, and by the time you leave in the morning, it's full, even if you didn't have load shedding at night, because the phone doesn't need the full 12 or 13 hours to charge. You know, so, so I think that's the first part of it. But yes, being aware of the load shedding schedule is, uh, you'll probably find easy drivers are more aware of it. Just simply, uh, I'll tell you, I've, I've been driving electric now for quite a few years, and there's been two occasions where, where I got caught with, um, with Esther. 
Okay, with load shedding. So the first one is, at home I've got batteries, so I normally don't have a problem with load shedding. But what happens is, if I leave my car plugged in when load shedding comes on, then my car flattens my batteries for the house. So the one day I forgot to unplug the car when load shedding started, and the car then the battery flat and I sat in the dark for about an hour. So until Eskin came back. So that was, I was impacted. But it didn't impact my driving. It just impacted at home, the convenience. The second time was, there was load shedding in the evening. I went out and unplugged my car like I always do. But that particular day, I'd driven a huge amount. So the car was actually very close to empty. And so I unplugged the car and I clean forgot about going back out and plugging the thing later on in the evening. And because of that, I woke up in the morning and thought, oh my gosh, I've got to get to the office. I don't have 75 k's. <clears throat> so I had to make a 20 minute stop at the, at a mall. There's a shopping center close by that was my Starbucks. So I went, stopped at the mall, plugged the car in, gave it 20 minutes, ran inside, grabbed a, a cup of coffee from the Starbucks. And by the time I got back to the car, I had about 100 k's of rain. So I was able to unplug the car and drive through to, to my office. So that's sort of the only two times that I've had it. Um, if you look in the media, there was a, a record set um, about a month ago um, by some guys, that, some journalists that drove a car from Cape Town to, um, to, or to Johannesburg, and, but an electric vehicle. And they did the trip in 21 hours, if I remember correctly, or just over 21 hours. Um, and I mean, normally in a petrol car, that's a 16, 17-hour trip. And they did that in stage six load shedding. And according to them, it didn't impact them at all. So, so they, maybe they were lucky. They just never got to a chest station that was under load shedding. But if they did, it would have delayed their time by an hour or so, you know, or while they waited for the load shedding to come back. So it really isn't as bad as what we perceive. It's not good, and we've got to fix it. I would say load shedding is an evil thing for this country, but it's not an evil thing for electric cars. Fantastic. And as technology keeps galloping along, Absolutely. so your charging time and your distances, etc., will be elongated. That's right. And, and your IT systems. You know, the, the cars are getting clever and clever at picking these things up. You know, our app that you use when you when you're doing um, when you're managing your charging sessions it will give you the load shedding schedule, so you can actually see ahead. If I'm driving down the M1, I can look and see, oh, when the inventors were at that time, there'll be load shedding there. Or I can either delay my start so that I miss it or drive a little bit quicker <laughs> than I get there before the load shedding starts. You know, so you can sort of do a little bit of, of strategic looking at those things. And I think the tech is going to help us to manage that better as well as we do. Thank you for talking to us again, Winston. Um, good luck. Are, are we expecting to see many more of your service stations going up or your fuel Outlets going up, or will you be changing direction? So we definitely can expect to see some more going up. Um, obviously, at a national level, so you know we're looking at quite a few things, uh, quite a few projects as to where we can do that. Um, you know, this year we've already done about 40 new systems. So, so I think over the next 12 months, you know, it's not unlikely that we probably do another 30 or 40 systems. And a lot of it is driven. We've got voting apps where people can get on and vote about where they want to see charges installed. So the more people that request it, the more we will then start to look at those areas. So we use those to, to drive the stats around that and see. I know there's a big drive now to close the gap between basically East London, or I'm going to say Port Elizabeth, um, and Durban, so up the M2 side of it. So East, I know East London has a charger, but the gap from East London to Port Elizabeth is 300 k. So we'd probably want to do one in the middle, which is going to be Port Alfred. And then we'll, we look, we've got sites identified now in Tata, in Corkstadt, in um, Port Chepstone. And basically that will then close the DC route all the way to Durban. So you'll then be able to drive that way around. Because right now, if you want to drive from East London to Durban, you've got to sort of go via PE and then um, Bloemfontein. You know that route. Yeah. If you want to have charging uh, charging stations along, so so hopefully soon there'll be some more done in that the old Transcar area. So you, will you be over two hundred by twenty twenty three, or are you already over two hundred? Yeah, no, we're, we're just under two hundred now. So yeah, maybe by middle of twenty twenty three in a year's time, I think we can be over two hundred. Dispatch Live appreciates your time.